What are three of the biggest challenges that people trying to maintain sobriety are facing today? That's what we're gonna be talking about in, as we continue our series for Easter 2024 about Rebuild My Church. We're trying to offer you, the church, the body of Christ, at least three actionable ways to work through some of these challenges as we bring in these professionals to help us understand where we need renewal in the church. I'm Lisa Martinez. I'm the founder of Little With Great Love. We are a restoration ministry of storytellers that use media to bring hope and healing and restoration in Christ. And I'm so glad that today I get to see my friend and introduce her to you, uh, our special guest, Christy Walker, the sobriety coach. Welcome, Christy. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here, Lisa. I'm so glad to see you and to be able to talk about this, this important topic. Always love a chance to talk to you. And then, of course, talking about sobriety, I think I, I know a lot of people in my life that this has, has affected and it's still affecting. And so I think that the work that you're doing based on your own story is so important. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing. Sure. So I actually just celebrated 27 years of sobriety myself just a couple of weeks ago on February 23rd. So that was so wonderful. Thanks be to God, because really it's only with God's grace that I've been able to do this one day at a time for 27 years. And I'm a wife, a mom, a podcaster and speaker. I have a podcast, the Catholic Sobriety Podcast, and I share lots of tips and information for anyone who might be struggling um, or wanting to even just reduce or eliminate their alcohol consumption or have a loved one who's struggling. And, you know, I didn't think that this was the work that I was going to be doing, <laughs> <laughs> but God has a, a way of just laying all those holy breadcrumbs so that we can follow them. And as long as we're obedient, we'll kind of follow along and get to where he wants us to be. So I have been in digital marketing for a really long time. I had my my own digital marketing company for about 13 years and just started becoming very dissatisfied with it. And it wasn't until I started working with a Catholic business coach that I discerned that God was calling me to coaching. And I was like, great, I'll do coaching. Who am I going to coach? <laughs> <laughs> and then he, in prayer and journaling, he's like, you need to share your story. You've kept it quiet for too long. You've kept it to yourself for too long. And now you need to share it with others because I have redeemed you and you need to share your story for my glory. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, and it resonates obviously with what we're doing because it's the same thing. And I think it's, it's through your story that people are able to see, wow, 27 years. And some people might not think that's possible. And I'm sure that there was a time that you might not have thought that was possible. So it's really awesome that, you know, the Lord has come up with this way for you to bring your story and your gifts, you know, forward to others so that they can know there's a way, there's a path, right? Yeah. Well, and it's interesting that you say that, that mm -hmm. people wouldn't believe that I would be able to do it for 27 years because my son, who is 10, was in class and one of the substitute teachers, she was talking about what they had given up for Lent. And she said that she gave up alcohol. And so he told me that. And I was like, that's great. You know, that's a really good thing to give up for Lent. And he was like, well, I need your coin. And I was like, what? coin. He's like, no, I need your coin, not one that grandma gave you. I'm like, oh, my 25 year coin. He's like, yeah, I need proof. I was like, what? He's like, I told everyone my mom's been doing that for 27 years and no one believed me. I'm like, <laughs> fifth graders couldn't believe you, <laughs> but they don't believe anybody about anything. So I didn't take that personally. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, I it just shows how ingrained it is in our culture. And I'm not yeah. saying that's what they experience at home, but they're just like, what? A grown up doesn't drink alcohol? That's ridiculous because they always do that on TV and movies yeah. and stuff. So, yeah, no, it's true. It is a part of our culture. So, you know, speaking of that, I'd like to kind of dive into some of these challenges that you're you're encountering through your own journey, through others that you're journeying with. Could you tell us? you know, kick this off with just one of the biggest challenges you see 
for those that are trying to maintain sobriety right now? Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges that that I see, and I've seen it for a very long time, I actually saw it in the very beginning when I was in the rooms of AA, is that a lot of us stop drinking and we can do that. You know, most people can, most people, depending on their level of attachment, can stop drinking for a certain amount of time. Some people, for some people that's, you know, days, weeks, months, even years. But what happens a lot of times when people return to drinking is they didn't really address the issues that propelled them to drinking in the first place. So a lot of people who suffer from alcohol use disorder, alcoholism, have underlying issues. They have trauma. They may have PTSD. They may have a bipolar disorder. They may have ADHD. You know, we, a lot of times people are using alcohol to self-medicate and to make themselves feel better. So I, I have seen a lot of times, especially within our Catholic community, that one, people are maybe not as much as they used to be, but still kind of hesitant to get counseling. And they're hesitant to get counseling sometimes because they're just afraid of like, what that means or who is going, who are they trusting with their mind and their thoughts and, and what's going on. And that can be really scary. So a lack of knowledge on, first of all, that the mental health issue is the underlying issue that needs to be addressed if they're going to be able to maintain sobriety. And second, part of that same one is who the heck do I go to? Like, how do I Mm. find out? Yeah. So what's a, what's one solution or some solutions that we could offer if this is happening, if we don't even know, you know, we don't even know that this is, this is kind of occurring or we don't know where to go. Yeah. I really think that like for me as a Catholic sobriety coach, maybe for other Catholic coaches, whether they're dealing with sobriety, anxiety, um, any sort even life coaching and those types of things and then if we can band together then with counselors and therapists catholic counselors and therapists spiritual directors you know we're mentors we're all offering something a little bit different but if we can all work together and say hey we need to let people know that we're here to help them and here's how they can find us i know sometimes it's hard for parishes to recommend people because they have to really vet them. They don't want to have people that are going to lead people astray if they've recommended them. But I think that there's a way to do that. And I really think it's time for our diocese and our parishes to figure out a way to do that and either have someone like one person locally within a diocese, you know, in the different areas or a person at every parish, just yeah. somebody that a priest or a deacon can send someone to and say, here, this person can help give you some resources that are going to help you on your on your way. You know, I, I've gone to um, a diocesan event where they brought in um, our sister ministry to speak about child loss and grief. And it was a way to, to then at that diocesan meeting that happens, I don't know, monthly or quarterly or whatever, that they could then learn about that particular ministry to then be able to offer that as an outlet, you know, and stuff. So if there is, you know, if there's not something like that happening, it could be that, you know, folks like yourself or whatever have to kind of try to organize grassroots a little bit more and say, let's, you know, let's get our cards together. Let's meet, let's figure out how we can kind of approach the diocese or approach that and saying, we know that there are people out there. I mean, I know here that we have some Catholic, you know, counseling centers and stuff, and they'll be able to recommend that, but there has to be a way that that's getting into the parish, you know, so that those resources can come. And that, uh, I mean, I've had priests hand things to me in confession before, you know, if they even had a stack of, you know, cards in the confessional or something like that to say, you know, if somebody's confessing something that's related to a particular, you know, misuse of alcohol or such, um, 
if you're really struggling with that and that's a repeated sin, why don't you talk to so and so they or look up this website, you know, they can provide some resources to help you. I think that there's definitely ways that we can do it. And it's just getting the information to the people who need it and finding out how to break down that barrier. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I love that idea. I've never seen that before, but then I haven't really confessed it something like that. So for <laughs> him to like pull it up. But it would be great. And I and I do think you hit the nail on the head when you said that it needs to be a grassroots effort because our parishes and our priests and everyone and our parish staff are just so stretched that really yeah. all of us as lay people, we do need to step up and start these ministries just like our parish has grief ministry. We have a veterans ministry. You know, we have women's and men's ministries. Why not have a ministry that is focused on mental health issues and um, addiction? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it's just people that are trying, are struggling with attachments, that can come together and just find support and, you know, be able to talk with one another. It doesn't all have to be um, you know, so difficult. And I think what you said is 100%. And that's why we're doing this series, Rebuild My Church, is trying to mobilize the laity more to say that we do need to step up and step in. And I think there's a lot of us that are kind of sitting on the sidelines. And, I'm, you know, I'm running this ministry, so I don't really get involved that much in my parish ministry. But I know that there's still things that, you know, God's calling that I can do locally here. And it's trying to figure out that sometimes. Some of us may not feel that we have a place. Well, I don't know how to use my particular gifts or I don't see anything that I kind of fit into or I don't really connect with something. Might be that chance to step forward and say, um, hey, you know, is anybody meeting about this? Do you think that other people might want to meet about this? You know, and then it could be bing, bang, boom. You know, here's a here's a meeting space, you know, set up a time, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely agree. I want to talk about our next point here, which um, is about the kind of the isolation and stigma that you have seen and experienced. You know, can we expand a little bit upon that? Sure. And I think you touched on it in just the end of yeah. the last one when you said that having something that where you can kind of band together. I was a woman in recovery or I don't, I didn't go anywhere. I was just like on my own because I didn't know anyone else, any other Catholic women who were in recovery. Now through my work, I've been very blessed to meet many, many others, but it's not something that we really talk about. You don't like just go to donuts and coffee and be like, Hey, did you know, you know, it's not <laughs> like, but I think if there are venues where uh, people feel comfortable being able to talk about that, or they know that there are other people that are like Catholic in recovery is a group. It's like an AA. I've been told that it's like a supplement to AA. And so that would be, um, it's not for everyone, but that would be for people who are looking for community and to really be able to talk through their recovery and have that support. But just as myself, as somebody who lived a long time as a sober person, not really knowing anybody else, feeling kind of just odd all the, when I would go to events and not, I had to learn how to respond when people would ask me if I wanted to drink, ask me often. Events often include several bottles of wine on the table. Now, I can honestly tell you, I have zero desire to drink, but the social aspect of it messes with me sometimes. Yes. Not that I would ever pour myself a glass of wine because I know what that would lead to, yeah. but it just makes me feel uncomfortable, it, which isn't a bad thing, you know, but it makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't have the confidence that I typically do if I'm in a room of people who have not been drinking and there's not alcohol being offered everywhere. So yeah. I, I definitely see a different version of me. And then with women that I've spoken to, clients or just women that I've talked to in general within the Catholic community, not always, but you know, Catholic school community, the auctions, yeah. we have a wine wall, we have a whiskey wall, there's wine yeah. on the table, there's, all, there's a signature cocktail. So this year, 
I, you know, I met with another mom who is new to sobriety and she was explaining this to me, like that it was bothering her a little bit. And I was like, you know what, that probably bothers a lot of people <laughs> who are trying to <laughs> reduce her or, you know, eliminate alcohol from their lives. And they're probably looking around the room feeling like they're the only ones and they're not, they probably are not, they just don't know and they don't notice. So it prompted me to go to our auction coordinator and say, hey, can I pr procure some non-alcoholic wine? Can we promote it? And would you be willing to add a signature mocktail in addition to the signature cocktail? And mm. she was like, sure. So I was able to procure wine. I was able to get them to have a signature mocktail. The bar also agreed to offer a variety of other non-alcoholic cocktail mocktails and things like that. And I think that it's just taking small steps like that. I'm not saying that any everyone has to bow down to like, oh my gosh, they're not drinking and we have to be so careful and, and all of this stuff. I'm yeah. just saying provide us some options because yes. if I go to a spaghetti dinner, which this happens all the time, I either get water or lemonade in like a Dixie cup and everybody else gets <laughs> wine or beer. And so it's yeah. like, there's not even non-alcoholic beer or non-alcoholic wine available to me. Yeah. And or like an Italian soda. I mean, come on people. It's not that hard. So <laughs> like, maybe like, something. Let's make the, and my husband's a knight. So yes, I know I need to bring this up with him. <laughs> like, where is it? Yeah. But um, yeah, I think just recognizing we do this for people who are vegetarian. My mom's a vegetarian. So I equate yeah. this a lot with her uh, choice not to eat meat. And I'm like, yeah, that's a lot like me. This is my choice not to drink alcohol. Um, it's just yeah. nice to have an option. And I think the more we can do that, you know, the more people will feel a part of things. I, I agree. And I think that it's not that hard, like you mentioned. And I know um, for some of our events, you know, we, we have had people that, you know, are not drinking. And it's, it's very easy to still provide all the other things that you're trying to provide and then to pr provide an environment, you know, that's comfortable for her as yeah, well. Yeah. And then the event isn't focused on something that, I mean, it, it's, it, it's not meant to be an alcoholic event. You know what I mean? It's like, it's an event and then alcohol becomes this part of it that's kind of could be polarizing. Mm -hmm. So how do we kind of drop that down and just say, Oh, I'm not asking you to take it out. I'm just asking you to provide, you know, some things right. that would also cater to us that are, you know, not. What you're really asking is like, can I be included? Can I be seen? You know, can I be a part of this? And how beautiful that they, you know, provided for that, you know, and you were willing to roll up your sleeves and do the work. So good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and one of the local parishes in town, I thought it was like the best thing ever. They had a girls' night, and it was like a mocktail night, and they set up like a whole mocktail bar. They made it so fun, and you know those types of things I just think would be so much better and more enjoyable because you're. I mean, I know that sometimes people drink because there's a level of social anxiety, and so it kind of calms them a little bit. Um, but those of us that don't drink, we don't have that luxury. We just have to like get through it. <laughs> so you you won't die, I promise. If you, if you're facing it. But I get it too. But I think having those options, I'm not saying you never can have it. I'm not saying that um, spaghetti dinners are focused on that. They're not. But I do think that certain events are very focused on it, like certain auctions or fundraising events. And that's really not why why we're there. So even just having those options and just promoting it a little bit, even in your materials or, or something, it just gets people thinking. And then I know like my husband, we went to his Christmas party. We went to this bar in Portland and they served a huge variety of non-alcoholic beverages. And so I know some of his coworkers who started with like a traditional beer, but then they still wanted beer, but they didn't want to you know, be too intoxicated to drive home or be hung over the yeah. next day. So they switch to non-alcoholic. Yeah. So, I mean, you don't have to be a person in sobriety or <laughs> even want to 
uh, reduce or eliminate, you might be fine and have no chaos around it, but it's just nice to have that other option. Um, so you yeah. don't feel like you're not part of it, which it's, yeah. it's a real thing. I think like, <laughs> our awareness of that can help support and make you feel more included. So great point. Sure. Let's move into the third point and talking about self-worth. This is a big one. Yeah, it's huge because when people stop drinking, when women stop drinking, men stop drinking, we kind of lose our identity. Like it's mm -hmm. often really wrapped up in who we are. Maybe you're the one that always brings the wine to the event. Maybe you're out in the car after the soccer game with all the other <laughs> moms, you know, <laughs> maybe you have your Stanley and you put a little nip of something in it before you do go somewhere and you're there with all your girlfriends doing the same thing well when you come to the real realization that that's not working for you anymore and it's causing a problem and probably you know you're feeling conflicted then all of a sudden you start feeling like this shame and guilt mm. and regret and just like it just it just like beats up on you and you beat up on you and um yeah, it's a really hard place to be in. You are like, am I going to lose my friends? Um, mm. What? Who am I anymore? What do I do? I'm going to be so bored. You know, there's all of that. Yeah. And it's all wrapped up into um, our self-worth and our identity are so connected. So. Um, what do you think are some options here for the church of how we could support and knowing how to walk with people through that it can be hard because a lot of times people are even if you drink like normally you might feel some level of guilt about like trying to talk to somebody about it um yeah. about what they might be going through but i think just recognizing like that's a struggle for you and i'm here for you and um knowing that um, there are people that are supporting you. I mean, yeah. I don't have, my husband drinks and I don't, just because he has a beer with dinner doesn't mean he doesn't support me. He does like a hundred percent. And so, yes. and I don't think any of us want anybody just to, um, to feel that way at all either. But at the same time, I just feel like maybe education about it, awareness around it, maybe even not maybe, but yes, starting with our kids, like, mm. and that can be tricky too, right? Because if you're starting to educate children on the dangers of alcohol or being aware of things, I was actually thinking of this, you know, how we all have to, I don't know if you do in your diocese, but we have to go through like virtuous training and we have to learn how to recognize, mm. um, you know, someone who might be grooming a child or someone who might mm. be uh, someone who might hurt a child or a vulnerable adult. And so we yeah. have to go through all of this training about it. And um, it's very difficult to watch, but it, I know that it's for a good reason. And I just feel like there, if there was something like that regarding alcohol dr and yeah. drug use um, on a smaller, more, um, approachable level for kids and then as it goes up to adults where we have to take that that too those types of classes too that would help us so much because a lot of times people are suffering in silence you know you yeah. might your friend Cheryl she might seem like she has it all together she might be the life of the party she might seem like she has no care in the world but she might be dying inside like she might have so much shame that she's turning to more and more alcohol just so she doesn't have to feel that shame anymore. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think that maybe awareness and developing some kind of education, okay. something that just like the Holy Spirit popped that into my mind, I think just a few days ago, because my mom was talking about the virtuous training that we do here. And I was like, we should have something like that. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. And I, I know that you've created resources too, you know, to, to try to help. Like, could you tell me a little bit about where we could find you online and what are some of those resources? Because I know that we all know somebody, if it's not ourselves, that's struggling. I know people, especially through the pandemic, that started taking up 
and it would, you know, one glass turned into two, two turned into three. Sometimes it became a bottle, you know, a night mm -hmm. that was happening just to try to cope. And again, it was just through the feelings that they were experiencing. And I know a lot of people are struggling with this. So where can we find you and, and what are some resources that you could offer through the work that you're doing? So the best place and first place I would direct anyone to is my podcast, the Catholic Sobriety Podcast. It's not just me talking. I try to have lots and lots of guests on people that are experts in certain areas that I'm not an expert in. And then just kind of sharing um, their wisdom and then my story and then other people that are, have overcome their addiction or disordered attachment, allowing them to share their story as well. Um, you can find me at my website, thecatholicsobrietycoach.com. I have pretty much all the information that I provide there. I have what's called the Sacred Sobriety Lab. It's kind of a course, but it's um, it's not just about like not drinking. It's It goes deeper, which is my hope, because as I was said at the top of the program, it's not just stopping drinking that's going to cure everything. It's really growing in faith, uh, looking at those things that caused us to drink in the first place and, and addressing those. So uh, the lab will help with that. And that's on my website as well. Um, as we're recording this, we're wrapping up on the first part of a Marian consecration. And Christy and I have talked about that. She's done it in the past and I'm doing one right now and leading a group. And um, the whole first part is about emptying ourselves, you know, and so it's emptying ourselves of the spirit of the world. And I can think of that, you know, in terms of there's so much that people are carrying. And in that, you know, they're seeking solutions. And part of it is, like you said, just self-medicating. And when you can start to identify, OK, I'm self-medicating and not just that I need to stop self-medicating, but why am I medicating? Mm -hmm. And the second part of our consecration that we're going right now is growing in self-awareness. And that self-awareness is just so key because there's all these blind spots that you have when you're just diving. You're, you're just trying to keep your head above water. You're just mm -hmm. trying to maintain. And so you're doing all these things as a coping mechanism, right? In order to just deal with, like you said, it could be underlying mental health issues. It could be loss that you're dealing with. It could be a lot of things. And when you start to peel that back and start to say um, what's underneath that, then the healing can begin. And I think your story shows that. And I love the work that you're doing over um, with your podcast, with your website, with this lab that you've put together. And I'm so happy that you've been here to share this with us. And I hope that some people will use this as a resource to give to people um, that are struggling right now. Yeah, I hope so too. And I just thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share it because I feel like, well, I know because God told me to. <laughs> the more yeah. I get the word out and others get the word out, uh, the more people are going to be able to find that freedom and that peace that they seek and essential and most of all jesus <laughs> absolutely i agree and so that's why sharing our stories and being able to you know present some of these challenges that we're facing and maybe knock down some of those that things that we just don't quite know how to navigate or we don't know where to find the things that we need it's important for us to um, gather to be able to do that so thank you again for being here christy and I think that, you know, for those of us that are really, we know somebody that's um, struggling in this area, we have something more than just saying, I'll pray for you or, or gosh, that's hard or something like that. But we can start to put some resources in their hands and direct them to things that will actually, um, you know, provide hope, healing and restoration. So God bless you guys. Let's go on and forward to rebuild the church and um keep uh, watching the series so that we can continue to see these ways that we can rebuild and renew the church. God bless.